Good morning, Luke. Good morning, Jordan. Hello. Hello. Luke. Hey, Adam. And hi, Luke. Nice to meet you. Hello, Jordan. Hello, Adam. Hi, Leanne. You can go ahead and uh, start pinging some people into the room here. I'll get our topics posted. And uh, good morning, Turquoise. Grand rising, everyone. Look at Eric over there in the sunshine. <laughs> hi, Turquoise. Hi, Eric. Hi, Sally. Hi, John. Hi, Susan. Hi, Tim. Hi, hi everybody. Everyone. Hey, Jordan, Luke, John. Adam, Sally. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning from my part of the world. I hope everybody's doing well. Always good to be here with all y'all. I'm looking forward to meeting Luke today. Sorry about that. I accidentally pulled Luke and I into a separate room. That wave at me feature. It's tricky. So may I assume this will be bottom up processing? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I was trying to make an obscure joke and it just landed absolutely nowhere. So Fine. never mind. <laughs> Especially because after PTRing, they're back on top. Got it. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, get us kicked off with our theme song here. And invite everybody to ping people who uh, might be interested to join us in the room. And uh, then we'll be able to get started. So here is our weekly uh, theme song, which is Our Love by Turquoise Sound, who you'll see up on the stage. And it's available on Bandcamp.
All right, that was the lovely turquoise sound um, who's on our stage. And as I mentioned, that song and her other music is also available on Bandcamp. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Luke, who's going to be leading us today. Um, yeah, that's about it. We'll go ahead and get started. Luke, take it away. Oh, thank you, Adam. And that, <laughs> that was really a great introduction this uh, the the song and the music and uh really got me into the mute mood of the subject um still not quite certain where to start today um because obviously it's a it's a huge subject and um well i'll, I'll try i'll try by doing this and i'll say <clears throat> when when you look at the subject of leadership i think there's there's a vast number of uh opinions and books out there and speakers and topics and uh, approaches and um, they're quite numerous and so the field is um, really very very diverse which is actually um, in favor of my theory and this is a bit strange and I'll get back to that so this this huge fragmentation this huge diversity of opinions um is actually sort of like supports uh what i'm talking about today and um this diversity of course goes into all sorts of directions so you have like the theoretical field you have this field of certain models and applications um you have all sorts of literature going from biographies of uh you know people who've been rather successful in their field uh, now claiming some sort of knowledge about that. Um, you have very personal accounts and uh, you have very personal opinions. And of course, you have the whole field of ethics and social science dealing with that. <clears throat> so it's a very, very diverse, you can also say fragmented field. And where I'm coming from, I realized that only like, I don't know, when I got into this, I, I sort of realized, oh my God, I'm getting into, into all of that um back back in the day and so what i got into was theory development quite specifically um because when i had finished my my mba which went rather well and i was uh you know i was being published i was being quoted by other literature i wrote my mba on strategic management in the public sector i thought well that went really really well maybe i should go into academia and you know just go for a phd and back then my supervisor said to me, why don't you write something about leadership in the public sector? And I said, well, I don't know, because I sorry, I already had the feeling I'm, I'm getting into all of that mess. 
And uh, but because he was so supportive and so um, encouraging, and of course, it's great if you have a top topic and a supervisor. I looked into it and he was actually right at the time that there was actually nothing there uh, back then in terms of theory development, especially not for the public sector. There was actually nothing. So he was right. He said, you know, something we need to start working on that. There is some need on that. So I started working on that. I reviewed all sorts of all the theory out there and all the models and looked into that. And uh, yeah, the theory in itself, the field of theory is interesting and you sort of can glean something here and there, but also it's very diverse, fragmented. Um, it's very difficult to build on. Um, back then also I'd started having problems like developing a, a theory, but the, <clears throat> especially when you, because, because he had nudged me into this direction of public sector. And, but what I noticed was very, something very, very strange. So uh, what I noticed already back then was um, so this question of values is, I think, not contested at all. Nowhere, in no theory, you would find um, th values don't matter. Like, that's that's not part of leadership. Like, nobody would question that. That's sort of like, there's some sort of consensus on that, at least, all right? <clears throat> and what I found very odd is that um, I dealt up to then also a lot with, uh, I'd actually gone to film school before that, and I'd studied a lot of... Uh, like uh, drama and script writing and all these things. And I was acutely aware that <clears throat> within Aristotelian poetics, values is central, right? So, I mean, probably most of you are aware with this, uh, you know, the hero's journey and how uh, scripts are basically written in this three act um, structure by which uh, the protagonist has a set of values is confronted with something, goes through a crisis, uh, faces some sort of antagonism, and these values done are either rearranged or renewed or uh, reset, or <clears throat> the protagonist even uh, gains a higher set of values. I found that very strange. I found it that very odd that uh, even back then that in leadership theory, values are central, and also in Aristotelian poetics, it's like, it's a central topic. So I became very much interested in this question of values. But that was about it. Um, the second aspect also maybe, it sort of like pointed into that direction was when I started doing interviews with people, started my research, I noticed that um, values usually are best revealed through narrative. Again, sort of like just reversing the, the Aristotelian poetics, like letting people tell their stories, um, you would quickly discover what they actually believe in rather than if you let them just talk about what they believe in. Like if you ask somebody, okay, what are your values? That person might say, well, you know, I'm for justice, equality, whatever. Um, but we all know that uh, actually the actions themselves reveal values rather than what you believe your actions are or what your values are. So I found that very interesting that if you let people talk about their stories, they would reveal their values through that. Um, but that was about it. I didn't really make any inroads with the uh, PhD. So I said, you know, that's it. Academics is not for me. Uh, I'm going to go into management. Okay, I, I studied management. Now I'm going to go into that field. I really want to work as an executive. So I did that for about 12, 15 years. And also there, I made some observations in the field, which were on one hand, it was interesting to see that, yeah, these management models, they seem to do something, right? They seem to order the environment which we work in, and they sort of produce clarity, results, uh, effectiveness, efficiency, and all that. And I found that very interesting because in the end, they're just like these mental models, and but they do something. They seem to do something with people uh, and with us who work together in organizations. But again... The theory, like the leadership theory, which I had been working on, didn't seem to do much. <laughs> so I, I was like going like, like I was trying to apply things which I'd learned in the field. So like believing, okay, that works. And I, you know, you apply what you learn and uh, see how that works out. It just struck me that these models in leadership and leadership theory were very crude. They were very, um, let's say, specific to a certain type of situation. They seem to block out a lot of the complexity which is going on. Um, they weren't able really to uh, capture 
um, yeah, the full richness of the situations, the fluidity, the unforeseen, um, the emotional and psychological, uh, yeah, complexity of that field. It was uh, it was simply not the case, for example, that if you believe in transactional or transformational leadership, and if you would apply that, that you would get certain results. Okay, so that didn't seem to like that's just didn't work. Like the whole thing, nothing worked. There were too many, many exceptions from the rules. Let's put it that way. So I found that very interesting. And when I stepped away from that, when I sort of like quit, um, I sort of remembered my PhD and I don't know, I don't I didn't know where exactly I got the idea from, but I thought it is weird that my experience of leadership has, is more akin to art than anything else. And I started working on that. And um, that's the story basically that I then, um, did my research, I finished my research basically on that field, on that hypothesis, and found many, many similarities. Uh, and um, my ambition was always to develop a theory which actually works, right? So of course you can have any sorts of theory or idea and say like, oh, that's the theory I have. And, and that's fine, you just put it out there and it doesn't have, even have to work or, you know, in this kind of field, it's, uh, you know, you don't, it doesn't really have to be disproven or proven. But I wanted to develop something where I went like, okay, there should be some benefit from that idea, not just a philosophical idea, but actually something which you could translate into models and apply it and, uh, you know, so that people would benefit from that. So that was my ambition. And um, yeah, that, so I, I think it does, it, it does work. Like you can really, you can really apply this theory. You can derive models from it, you can derive a coaching process from it, you can derive educational processes from it, you can derive team building processes from that, um, you can derive ethical principles from that. Um, and also what I found very interesting is that, you know, all other, it doesn't contradict any existing model or theory. It just, um, it's, uh, I always compare it to like the elephant's footstep, right? So the elephant's footstep is big enough for all other uh, footsteps to fit into it. So whatever theory you um, take or model, it fits, in, <laughs> it fits nicely into this model of an art form. And coming back to the beginning of my story where I said there's this huge diversity, there's this huge subjectivity on leadership, I don't find that a problem anymore. It also fits into this elephant's footstep because it's like art, right? That's the point. If you would go like back then when I was still studying cinema, I would go to the movies and I was, uh, you know, I was uh, somebody who was trained in the field. I was an expert. I was proud of my years of education. But what sort of always bothered me was that you get out of the movie and everybody has an opinion, right? Oh, this movie was great or this actor was great or did you see how they did that? And then you said, well, you know, I, you know, my, my opinion, it wasn't such a great movie. So, you, but your opinion was just like, my opinion was just one of many. And that's what I feel is that's why it's, it's an art form. So art has that quality of this subjective response, which is just as valid as the response of anybody else. Right. So, and that is very interesting to me. So that's also where, you know, I get back to the beginning and say, it's, it's something, the fact that it's so subjective also points to the fact that it's an art form. So that's my introductory <laughs> statement, or that's my, um, um, yeah, I could go on, um, but perhaps we can just have a conversation and see where that leads us. Yeah, so um, again, uh, if, if there's uh, some sort of um, thoughts which are coming up, I'd be happy uh, to engage in those. Or uh, again, I'd, I'd prefer to have a conversation about the, around the topic and see what the initial response is uh, instead of just um, going on. Yeah, so we'll just go ahead and open it up to the moderators. Luke, that was great. And um, anyone in the audience who wants to raise their hand, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you, Luke, and to anybody else in the audience, but uh, this room tends to be really comfortable with uh, long silences. So uh, if you put a prompt out there and everybody sits with it for a minute or two, 
that's good. You just wait. They'll they'll uh, they'll speak when they're ready. It's um it's a nice feature of the room. So I'll go ahead and open it up to everybody. I will say, um, the uh, well, we had one question just come in. Equity Muse asked uh, if you'd uh, be able to define art form or um, what you mean by art form with it. Yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, interesting. First of all, uh, there is so the point was, of course, you can't say, "Oh, then leadership is like acting, or it's like uh, dancing, or it's like uh, architecture, or something like that." Um, that doesn't work, right? So it it has to be like it should be defined as an art form in itself. And so, what would be its key characteristics, right? What would be like its uh, core elements or something like that. How would the craft be defined? And there's a there's there's some problems there. First of all, that the craft has not yet been defined. And even if I would now start defining it, which I can you know give some examples how to define it, uh, we don't have a long-standing history of of looking at it as an art form or educating people in it as an art form. Even if you would go to art school. You know, there's a lot of uh, dissents on how to teach actually painting or acting or filmmaking. Um, and maybe you would find, again, some core elements in filmmaking or writing uh, where you would like to say, okay, well, maybe in the discipline, there is a little bit consensus about three or four points, but the rest is really, there's a lot of different methods how to approach that. And of course, in leadership, we have the problem of that doesn't really exist, right? There is no... Uh, art which has been developed in the sense of um, yeah decades let's put it this way I mean if even if you look at acting uh, the whole point of acting uh, I mean I always rem I'm always reminded by Stanislavski Strasberg and so on who, who started to write these books about acting and say and started to say well how do we define it how do we teach it what are these core elements actually of acting uh, and we're not even at that point, it's in my, in my humble opinion. Um, so what I, what I prefer to do is I look at across different art forms and I try to see common elements, which, you know, perhaps I haven't like discovered all of them, but some of them for sure. And um, for example, the, the question of metaphor, the question of symbol, the question of fluidity, the question of crises, uh, the question of complexity. So you would find those uh, characteristics in many different art forms, music, writing, uh, as I said, poetics, and so on and so forth. And then you would go like, well, what would that mean in terms of leadership? Like, how would that factor into this art form of leadership if I take these elements and look at leadership? So that's what that's what I was doing then, and that's how I was expanding or trying to build this art form, which is called leadership. So it has to be basically, if somebody said bottom up, like <laughs> it has to be developed bottom up. There is no ground to stand on. This art form is something which needs development, basically. Um, so I don't know if that was helpful. morning, Luke and everybody here. I'm Sally and thank you for that. And I just love hearing the enthusiasm in your voice and the passion in, in your heart as you bring together the love of your initial love of the arts with, with leadership. Um, I think the more we integrate this understanding into just about everything, the better, because we've had this false object subject split that we're dealing with and um anytime we integrate those two things we've gone to a higher level so thanks for that luke and doing a phd in that is no easy matter and you've obviously developed it to an art so that's wonderful and um when we understand that even scientific things such as medicine is best practiced as an art as well just about everything when it's when you bring the artfulness to it you've taken it to a higher level and um, 
And I love this idea that you relate it to story. Um, I was thinking the other day that the whole of life is really just a, a series of conversations. And when you think about that, like, wow, each time you relate to somebody new, there's conversations. And out of those conversations and the clusters come stories. And out of the cluster of stories come narratives. And out of the cluster of narratives come discourses. And, and then, you know, then we start studying the discourses and hegemonies. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. So relating just about everything we do to that respect for the subjective instead of the, uh, the way we've treated the subjective up till now, which is to dishonor it and say it's not valid as the objective is, it's beautiful. And at the deepest material level, what we're doing is integrating the left and right brain. That's what we're doing. So the more we integrate our understandings of arts and sciences, the more we integrate our actual personal brain as well. I mean, so that's the job on planet Earth, I think, is to keep integrating more and more. So thank you so much for that introduction, Luke. I look forward to hearing more from you. I'm Sally, I'm complete. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sally. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, especially when it comes to the ob uh, observation of the objective and the subjective, it seemed to me, so, so the most interesting thing about leadership theory is to me that the, that the attempt to create an objective observation of what is going on in that phenomena, simply do it, doesn't, it doesn't work in the sense that it's, it, you, you can sort of drive utilization from it or something like that. So that was, that's that was that's pretty obvious. Like there's an attempt to do that, but it just remains an attempt. And I think the um, again the fear of the subjective is is apparent in that field to say, uh, well, we can't go into that. That's not who we are as people who study that field, who are into social science or behavioral science or even psychology or econ economists or whoever are studying that field because it's like everybody seems to have wants to apply some sort of um, academic rigor to that field and try to create something objective, right? And so that doesn't seem to work. As far as I can see, it doesn't seem to work. And even attempts to do that in a real life scenario, if you think about uh, application, right? For example, leadership evaluation tools, they, I, I don't know, I don't think they work because they try to create a, a pseudo objective uh, environment with all sorts of criteria, where actually what's more important is the um, the subjective understanding of what is happening. So what am I perceiving here? What is going on? And also the other way around. But once you sort of like drop that, because in art, for example, subjectiveness is not a problem. <laughs> like it's not it's not even an issue. It's actually accepted as you know being the core of it then um, you lose all those problems. They just vanish, um, which doesn't make it much easier, but still um, you, you can start developing something. And coming back to the subjectiveness part, again, what's interesting is, you know, coaching works. That's weird. So although we don't have good theory and do good as, as far, again, that's just my personal uh, point of view, but that's how I see it. Um, but we don't have that, which is sort of like, really gives us something to work off still coaching seems to do something for people because it's very subjective it's very geared towards the individual and that seems to be doing something so and i I'm, i have res i respect that so i respect anybody who's in that field in terms of you know working as a coach or helping people to become yeah more themselves or uh, feeling better and all that so that there seems to be something there Um, uh, uh, Luke, let's see, um, this is uh, Wendy here, and uh, I have a question about how to bridge between 
the dominant paradigm in leadership, which is seems to me to be science, and what we seem to know from lived experience, as well as a, a, quite a bit of research that was done around the intersection of art and leadership uh, in about 2010, 2011. And um, what do we know about, what we know about this intersection of creative process and leadership as creative process? Uh, where where this question is coming from is how do we bridge so that there is enough credibility to be able to have an artful approach to leadership development take root? Where this is coming from was, um, and this has been an inquiry I've been exploring for about 15, 15 years, and I brought it to teaching at a lot of cutting edge leadership centers, um, Banff Leadership Center, which is very much arts infused, and uh, Alia, which was uh, Authentic Leadership and Action Institute, which had a lot of creative process embedded in. Um, and, and I'm thinking about, I, I've had conversations with people um, about this question. I know that in uh, David Horth, Stephen Pulse, when they wrote their book in 2011 about um, creative competencies for leadership that are were fundamentally created by interviewing and working with artists um, for the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro, North Carolina. And they knew that this stuff worked, but they found that they could not bring people into the work. And they basically gave it up after writing their, the book, The Leader's Edge. And there was a lot of work that was going on at that time, and it seemed like it almost plateaued. And so um, the only thing that I've seen, I, I, so I took a real deep dive into complexity and applied complexity because it's a scientific framework that seems to map a lot on top of especially collective creative process. It's a lot, you know, the, the, the role of emergence and the role of uncertainty and learning on the fly and learning from doing. There's a lot of overlap, but there's still, I've, I've had to go in the direction of the dominant discourse of science to be able to even bring this other these other ways of knowing that seem to me just have a whole lot to do with how do you lead, especially in complex and uncertain and changing and collective environments. So any thoughts on how to bridge when the the your project is in some ways so countercultural? Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I've been dreaming about that subject, and um, so I'm, I'm. I think I'm. I'm. Yeah. I, I'm basically also where you're at. I'm really going like, okay. I worked on this. Um, I also worked with people, and uh, have applied um, these tools, and they work really well. Like, it's it's maybe that's the point. So so on one hand, I think you're absolutely right. It's an uphill battle. The institutions somehow, as far as I can see, are are not are not necessarily forthcoming about this whole idea. Um, it's difficult to communicate at times. It doesn't seem to be in this group. I think this group there's like a intrinsic, like as far as I can hear, some going like, like, yeah, why not? That's sort of like that could fly. Um, but uh, amongst let's say experts who work in the field or coaches, it's very very difficult to basically cut through and say, well, have you thought about this perspective and it's exactly as I say, Wendy, in terms of how to deal with complexity, creativity, innovation, it all maps into that again, like into this idea of art. Um, the only hope I have at this point is, is two. First of all, um, you know, maybe to build a community of like minded people and network with them and say, well, this is obviously too much for one or even two people or three people to move forward to move the needle into that direction to give it the uh let's say attention credibility uh it would require to shift mindset right because uh all sorts of institutions are on top of that and they claim a different perspective than this one and the other is well down the road somewhere you have to uh show results you have to show or produce results which are just superior 
And um, again, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, you know, method acting, um, actor studio and things like that. So certain schools which were developed at the time and also got a lot of blowback and then it, they just established themselves over time because they just um, develop or they help people to do their craft at a much higher level. And if that happens, if that shows that sort of, um, uh, yeah, effect, then I think that the, the theory and the background will also get more attention. So those are the, two, the only two things I can think of. Both of them are a little bit, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's got, it, it, both of them feel like a little bit of a rocky road to travel. Hello, Luke, Adam, and everyone. Um, I, um, you know, I, th I hold the same kind of uh, inquiry or actually exploration as Wendy. I think there was a, there's a lot of intersection in, uh, in how we have approached leadership. Um, and I found it very interesting uh, that you mentioned that the PhD was, uh, you know, initially centered around public uh, sector because that's where my kind of first experience work experiences were and was and um, and I and I want to just bring in lived experience rather than question and then uh, see where what what that might feed in into the conversation so for me what I noticed was that as I was you know uh, work developing the work developing myself and being very oriented towards processes and through towards the creative process intrinsically i was finding myself creating environments for others and in that creation of that art form in a way i was the artist and in that sense there was something around by setting the environment, the space for those to then use their science, right, to actually follow the um, methodologies that they want to do and in, in, in action and in doing the things that they needed to do, but uh, setting an environment which opens them to something else, expands them, allows them to um, be curious. Um, shift the way of operating. I realized that I was, in a way, first being within myself leading and creating a leading environment, right? And that the actual people in position were not capable of doing it, not because they were not capable, but because they were bound, I mean, in, in a public sector environment, um, and I'm sure maybe in other institutions, but they were bound by conditions and by regulations and by um, an old structure. So what I'm bringing here is, if leadership is an art form, where are the artists who are bringing in that leadership? And I feel that that's the, that's the invitation and the question because then something else starts to expand and a lot of times they're invisible you know so it, it doesn't have to be loud um yeah i, I just wanted to uh, you know bring in bring in that experience and that uh inquiry or curiosity and i'm complete Can I chime in? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How you doing, Bruce? So it's good morning, good afternoon, good evening, next to the woods. Uh, I'm from Saudi Arabia, from the shores of the Red Sea, city of Jeddah. Um, to answer your question, to me, in my opinion, that's the essence of being a leader. Um, you have to, to seek invisibility to be able to to not be noticed yet develop others and the environment for sustainability 
it's an utopia type of environment. It's an ideal state of mind. But that's what a leader is. A, tele- a leader is, a, is a, as Jack Welch mentioned once, is not only the vision officer, it's a heart officer. Gives without sacrificing, without asking for anything in return. Your, your, your goal is the vision of the purpose. The purpose is the ambition, the Tassam Sinek, the infinite game, more importantly than your own selfish needs. Your ambitions is to see everyone else reaches his or her goal, goals towards the, the ultimate vision of the institution that you function with your family siblings, quote unquote, rather than your colleagues. If you are able to achieve such a state of mind, then you might just think of yourself as a leader without anyone else noticing it. I'm out, Mohammed. Yeah, thank you. I <clears throat> like I just feel that there's there were like these two themes of um yeah, on one hand the question, well if the environment is so restrictive or let's let's say it, it poses so many um, demands on the individuals or in the groups involved, uh, as it does, you know, in, in many organizations, specifically the public sector, uh, you know, what what could that imply? And I absolutely agree. I've worked in the public sector myself for ten years, and um, I can see that clearly. Uh, probably also the private sector. By now, there's many many regulations and restrictions. And um, the interesting thing also about this, the, the, the perspective of art is that, of course, in art, there's also a lot of discipline, which some in some arts you have to learn over years. And you only gain this kind of flexibility by, let's say, learning the rules of the game. Uh, Mohammed just mentioned this, uh, the game and the, the play in that. And then you sort of like are able to... Um, play with these rules and start to become more flexible as you move ahead. Um, That's that's number one. And that seems to be doing something like with the people I work with, they also work in the public sector. The second is, well, couldn't the artistic impulse come from somewhere else? And I absolutely agree. But for the artistic impulse to uh, come from somewhere else, you need to have that artistic mindset. Like, what does what do many movie directors do? They're very well aware of the creative potential of their team, and they are very well aware of what they can contribute. And they would never ever think that they could do the same. I mean, they're they're not you know they're not um, screenwriters, they're not actors, but they have this ability to integrate that creativity into a whole or give it this needed space and create the culture so that somehow some coherence is possible, some wholeness is possible, some sort of collaboration is possible. So they're acting on this very high level of um, creative ability, like creativity 2.0 somehow. somehow. And um, that would be interesting to study, for example, how, what, what's, what exactly is going on there? How do they manage to do that? Um, so that's just two thoughts. Hey, Luke, this is Jordan Gruber. I want to thank you for your wonderful presentation. And what I've done, and and what you said from the beginning seemed obviously right. Uh, I I just flowed with the whole introduction and agree with everything you said. And while I was doing that, I was Googling art and science. And there's any number of lovely Venn diagrams that, you know, on the left have art, self-expression, no rules, abstractions, exaggerations. And on the right is science. You know, rules contribute to consensus on workings must be repeatable. And but then in the middle, there's this huge overlap of creativity and push boundaries and curiosity and experimentation and wonder, repetition and refinement, describe mastery of techniques, making something totally new, obsession. It's it's all of that. So I think there's no question that we need more of the art. And I hear you suggesting that there isn't enough of it. And this reminds me of when I I have a master's degree in public uh, policy analysis and administration. 
and, uh, and the, the senior, uh, the, the final test or thesis or whatever it was I did, went through this back and forth between theory X and theory Y, which back then in the you know, early 80s was theory Y was still the new thing. And what, what we, it was pretty easy to show is that historically there's a flip. It goes one way more towards uh, that it's management, it goes one way towards being open and really value-based and really, you know, wanting to help people and bring out their talent. And then it goes back the other way. And how do you get the most out of people? And how do you, you know, what are the rules and, and how does that work? So it's really nice to see you giving the, the, the you know, more to the art side and then I was also looking a little bit up about uh, your ideas about art and liminality and how art itself is a spiritual act. So my question is, if, if we're bringing more art into management, that then is a spiritual act also, isn't it? And that's what makes it so revolutionary. Uh, this is Jordan, and I'm done. Well, Jordan, I'm really glad I met you and came came you. <laughs> because... And I'm glad you raised the question of spirituality because um, it is also interesting to say that there's also these streams in terms of spiritual leadership, right? So that is also a thing which is going on to say, <clears throat> well, it all flows from, from, from this you know, place of higher consciousness and higher values. So you know, that is also a theory that then then the practice is more to become aware of that place of higher consciousness. And that's when, what is called spiritual leadership, not only within uh, religious communities, but generally as something which is, uh, you know, which is uh, propagated and talked about. And um, yes, I would say uh, art is a, is a spiritual act and uh, can be felt as such. And ideally, of course, uh, so would be leadership, right? So again, this idea that even this stream could be integrated there and say, well, you can take it even there because of course art and uh, spiritual experiences are interconnected at times for those people who choose to do so. <laughs> so let's put it there diplomatically. But I'm really great, uh, grateful that you raised this point, Jordan. Thank you very much. Hey, Luke and everyone, it's Jane speaking. Thank you first, Jordan. I don't hear Theory X and Y or McGregor referenced very much in my life. Uh, and um, one thing about that that I think is important to clarify is on the behavioral side, I agree with your description, but what's underneath Theory Y is a totally different like belief set about humans and their goodness and what's possible. And I think that gets totally lost, not by you, Jordan, but those who in the 80s, when that theory from the 50s got popular, I think um, there was a lot of like people like, oh, let's do theory X. But as we used to talk about it with former colleagues, just being a nice guy, theory X guy, gender neutral, is not theory Y. Theory Y starts with a basic belief in the infinite potential of human beings, as you probably know. So I don't know any company that operates that way, except one where I worked, used to work. And this is the two things I wanted to share. One, as you were speaking, um, Luke, before, and lots of us following the thread, that I think that the reason it's so hard to be artful, at least in corporate context that I'm familiar with, about leadership is because, I don't know when, but at some point management just got you know a new label slapped on and called leadership. And I, I don't think, I haven't experienced many traditional organizations really wanting to have truly relational leadership relationships or power sharing versus power over and all, all the integral stuff. So uh, I find that's just what I wanted to input on that. And then the other was, um, in the place where I work. I don't know why I'm not naming it Gore as the company. I think I'm working out my issues. That's why I probably am working to not name myself as a person who used to work there, but started by someone who didn't want managers, no bosses, and, and it worked. They did not have bosses. They did not believe in it. I wasn't there, but I learned a lot about it. But what happened, leaders emerged. It literally was natural, and I think, very beautiful and artful. And it didn't mean because you had a certain job. It 
happened organically at the best moments. It was highly imperfect and very expensive, by the way, to run a company like this. Um, but that was beautiful. That, I, I think those type of things, and I don't know if Turqu well, Turquoise is here or if she has time, but I'm curious about all of the ideas about self-organizing and when that really works in organizations. I wonder what you've seen, Luke, about this. Um, maybe that's one of the ingredients, seeing leadership as more of an art form. So that's the question I'm sitting with. So thanks. Thanks, Jane. What just came to mind is like, uh, it sort of makes sense, actually. Like, yes, this again, this question of emergence and that people are recognized for their talent. And that always also, so <laughs> I know I'm biased, right? So I got to be excused. I'm biased here. But that also, again, speaks to the idea of art because an artist is not an appointed an artist, right? It's not like, okay, you're now, you're now going to be, I'm just going to make you now the uh, artist in chief. Of course, that does happen. But in general, you do need some capabilities and competencies to do that, and especially talent. So what you're speaking to is this whole idea of emergence and the talent is being recognized and, and all that. <clears throat> I just wanted to add that there's some, there's, but there's also drawbacks to this idea. For example, I, I always say then, you know, if you, because uh, if you say it's an art form, basically what you're doing is you're not, um, the, the good and the bad from that is you're not making ethical implications, right? which means however the art is exercised is how it is exercised. And in art itself, there's this huge debate, you know, is, uh, is marketing an art, is uh, creating uh, advertisements and art and all that. And I would say, yes, it's just a certain type of art and maybe it's a little bit more shallow or maybe it's more uh, geared towards exploitation or money-making and all that, or is, you know, our, our shallow Hollywood movies art. Um, so I don't go into that. I go like, yeah, that's all art. It's just, it's just different shades of that. So within that, you know, it could also be that certain types of leadership, which we don't agree with are still art and they might create an environment which we don't like, but it's still art or it's, or maybe the environment is particularly shallow or it's just based on, uh, exploitation or, making money and that's of course things which we don't or i wouldn't personally approve of or i would like to see but it's something i would have to accept within that theory to say well it's, i'm not making an ethical statement i'm not saying uh you have to behave like this and this and this and this to be great at what you're doing right um i'm just saying hmm, that's probably a good way of looking at it um mainly because i believe then you, we would have something in our hands to offer people to uh, find more meaning in what they're doing and also create more meaning uh, in their lives and especially in their work environment. And this would be good for everybody, but how they're gonna do that, it's up to them. <laughs> like, I don't know. So yeah, that's, that's the, that's the uh, I would say that's partially the drawback. So the loss of ethical control over this idea. And um, anyway, that's, that's it. Wonder if I could jump in here. This is uh, Izzy. Yeah, please go ahead. Floor is yours, Izzy. Oh, oh thank you. Um, I have uh, f first time in the room, uh, stumbling around the hallway and uh, found the art leadership connection um, drawn to it. My work is about leadership through um, improv theater principles. That's what I've been doing for a number of years. And the idea- <laughs> The program that I that that I offer most often is called "Becoming the Leader You'd Like to Follow," and it really is connected to the skills and training that improv people use. And so many of the things that we touched on—it's not improv theater; it's applied improv, application of principles and practices to non-theatrical outcomes. So, for example, the spiritual or the ethical piece. There is a a meme in in improv that says, "Make your partner look good." So if we're coming as a leader from making your partner, the people you, who follow you look good, that I think raises the, 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 uh, the trust factor, that, uh, the, the vulnerability factor, being able to be real and vulnerable and take risks without shame or blame, working together. <clears throat> as you do that for yourself, you build a climate where people are willing to follow you because they want to, not because they have to. 
Uh, and and one, one other thing that, that that's come up is how leadership and improv work. If you think about le- uh, improv, it's essentially a um, mission-driven, goal-oriented team development where each person is at various times leader and follower. When it's your turn, people have to follow you. That's that's the consent. When it's someone else's turn, you have to yes and. That's the consent. And by understanding both ends of this leadership spectrum, and, and because improv does not have real world consequences, you can take risks that aren't necessarily the same you would take if there was a judgment involved. You really begin to learn um, who you are authentically. And you become the real person and that becomes the real leader. Uh, spiritually, ethically, uh, playfully, uh, vulnerably, uh, I, I could go on, and, <laughs> but I will stop now. And uh, I appreciate the room and, and I look forward to, to more. This is Izzy, I'm done for now. Izzy, that's amazing. That's amazing. I want you as a professor at my new leadership school. <laughs> let's oh, talk. Yeah. Let's talk. That's amazing. LinkedIn. Let's yeah, do let's LinkedIn. Do this. Let's, yeah, let's do like a Bauhaus a leadership Bauhaus. I love school it. Of the yeah, yeah. Twenty first um, century. <laughs> let's become the new Walter Gropius. Uh, and uh, can, can, can I know, like this? Can I make a fast pitch? I, I have a room, the Applied Improv and Humor room. And I'm doing some leadership programs uh, uh, with some folks who do positive intelligence about um, uh, the, there's a woman named Angie Alexander who does sage leadership. So we're starting to to develop kindred spirits in various fields. So I'm very interested in in, in the work that you're doing and what, what other people here uh, uh, are, are kindred spirits. So uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm done for now. So, <clears throat> good morning. Um, I will jump in here. I um, appreciate what you set up, Luke, as I am um, the undercurrent and actually a chapter in the book I'm currently reading. Um, one of the chapters is Leadership as an Art. It was a formational book for me early in my design of my leadership academy. I have a four-week leadership academy and it takes on different weeks it, for numbers of weeks in different companies and agencies. But when I first started more than 30 years ago playing in the leadership world, Max Dupree's Leadership as an Art, um, I came uh, was it uh, really struck me and this playing with leadership and science and systems thinking because I was coming out of um, engineering and architecture and I, in studying in architecture, um, it's just, it's too long to, to frame at this point, but I came into leadership with, um, a perspective of leader as social architect. And, and, and I used that for many years. Um, but I, I don't use it as a, as much anymore because people tend to go to immediate mental model of putting form on people. Um, from my training in architecture and landscape architecture and urban design, um, the role of the architect is to focus on the inhabitant in the space. The great architect designs a building that is focused on how do people feel the energy move through this space? How do you feel in relationship to other people when you're in this space? And the, to get people to, 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 and so the role of the leader is to focus on the, um, the inhabitant in the system. What's the emotional space? What's the, how, how can people tap their highest potential in this organization, in this system that we set up as leaders? And so at the core of all of my leadership development has been art because um, the only way, so my work is building the capacity to see the systems, to see the invisible systems and structures based on relationship and trust that actually drive performance. And art was the only way to get people to access the 
the deeper places of their leadership. And so it's not something that I lead with, but it's something that I use in, I, I never teach anything that I haven't brought in some kind of art to get people to get out of the cognitive, to get out of their heads, to get out of, it's the journey. Like we've brought in um, the first time I ever had the craziest looks when I came into working in the Office of Executive Development in the mid nineties in the federal government, my job was leadership and organizational development for all 112 federal agencies. And I was working with the folks you were talking about, Wendy, at CCL and some of that research. And I brought, we wheeled in a grand piano into the government, you know, executive development center. And I had colonels and high level government people laying under the piano to feel the resonance. And, um, but the first time we brought in the grand piano, I, I mean, people wanted to fire me. Um, but we couldn't get the CCL folks that were doing that research. It was really powerful, but they couldn't hold the room. They hadn't figured out the connection to get people to understand what that means practically. And uh, it was my friend, Michael Jones, who we just lost in January, who really brought that in with his piano. But I've also used it through poetry and we've used it through accessing different parts of the brain through drawing. I never do a leadership timeline of the crucible moments without having people draw, which is really uncomfortable for them. But the a bit, but art is precognitive. It gets us out of our head. It gets us the dramatic arts. I've brought in the folks. Um, I've been a, brought in a lot of improv folks, Izzy. Um, and the, so yes, absolutely. And this balance of leadership as an art versus science is it's also a science and it's, it's this playing with both of those. That's the tapping the subjective and dealing with a world that's still very mechanistic, but in order to tap the living system, in order to tap the um, complexity, I don't know any other way than to use art over all the years that I've um, taken people on journeys, but it's also a journey of experiencing, but you, experiencing it and um, that I almost always have to use science and outcomes and results to get the credibility to have the permission to use the art and the art is what shifts things but the you know the using the the objective stuff is what gives me the credibility and permission to use art and then going back to people after they've experienced it and say okay do you see that this was the moment you shifted that leadership is an art that it's the deeper inner parts of how you show up um, the inner parts of your own journey, the inner work of leadership, that is the most important work. And it's one client I'm dealing with right now, um, 85 year old manufacturing firm. Um, they've got, you know, they're playing with art down on the manufacturing floor and, and um, with people who have not spent time in the arts in their lives at all. Um, and it, they see what it taps, um, but they all, but, um, anyway, there's so much to be said. This is a beautiful topic. I love how everybody has jumped into it and, um, and it's something that I have lived out to be true for the more than 30 years of my leadership development. It's, I started, and part of it was starting out in an intersection of art and science and architecture um, and playing with that early on and, um, and a lot of what you were Googling Jordan is that space of, of those being opposites versus those being deeply intertwined in the human soul. Um, and yeah, the art proves the science and the science proves the art. And so Thank you. I'm Pam and I'm complete with my ramblings. Thanks. I just wanted to say quickly um, that uh, I 
I, I love that you're an architect and you come from arch architecture. I think that's fantastic. And um, yeah, I just, it, I, I, you know, I looked for a lot of material and uh, I found like a very interesting interview by Balkrishna Doshi. You might, you know, people might not like his architecture, but how he talks about architecture is very interesting. And also along, along the lines of you just said what you just all said, Pamela. So we're not going to repeat that. So I think architecture also has a lot to offer in terms of leadership, which is, again, is the everything what you just said. So I'm not going to repeat that. And uh, wonderful. Thank you. There's also um, um, Roger Nirenberg. We've brought him in in large large gatherings of leadership development with a full orchestra and he goes through the intersection of art and leadership from the orchestra perspective and ben zander does the same thing he has a book um integrating a lot of that he's got this great quote of being a one buttocks leader when he talks about playing the piano and that somebody who's truly in i had i walked into a client one time and they had they had a sign on their office above their desk that said be a one buttocks leader and he tells the story of of teaching great pianists and when great pianists are playing they're never sitting on both both sides of their butt at the same time and they're so passionately into it that they lean to one side or the other and that they're that they're they find themselves on one side or the other and and that's when they're truly lost in the piano and and he talks about what that means in leadership and passion that you've lost yourself that your body is so intertwined with how you're showing up and the what you're playing so there's yeah there's all kinds of people who've done some really cool from um uh, and Nett Simmons, another friend of mine who came, she and I designed in 96, a storytelling workshop on accessing story through drawing and accessing, accessing values through story and then, um, and looking at what that means as leaders. So, so yeah, there's all kinds of beautiful stuff from different places of, um, you come in from, um, I think you said screenwriting and producing and such. And um, the folks who wrote Executive Leadership to Women um, wrote a fabulous book. I think it's called, no, it's called Executive Presence. Um, and they are were drama teachers. And so they came in and talked about leadership from the perspective of that. So anyway, thank you. Can I just jump in here real quick? I've been noticing AM has been uh, unmiking through a number of speakers and, and quietly remiking, so I'd like to cue him up if that's okay. Thank you, Dr. Eric. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I'm actually technically working today and just listening, but I, I, I wanted to make a quick observation off of uh, Jane's um, comment from a little bit ago about emergence and, and what that requires. Um, I think we'd all agree that uh, dance is an art form and that uh, those who have mastery in dance and teach uh, from a mastery in dance um, you know, are engaged in teaching an art form. And I think we'd agree that photography is an art form and that there are uh, individuals who have mastery in photography and teach from a place of mastery in photography. But dance and photography are different media. And if a photography master teacher attempts to teach a dancer, um, there's a good chance that the dancer, that the dance student will get hurt, uh, even though there is a great overlap of um, background principles and uh, ontologies and um, challenges around exploring voice, etc. Fundamentally, if a master photographer attempts to teach dance, someone will get hurt. Uh, over the last 20 years, we've had a great deal of uh, career damage and organizational damage um because we fail to understand that organization like photography like dance like a canvas is a medium and um requires not just the general mastery of developing um, individuals in artistic expression but the specific mastery of the medium that is organization and absent that medium mastery uh, an instructor is highly dangerous to the people that they're working with and we've had a lot of that in the last 20 years. And, and then, so now that leads me back to uh, uh, Jane. Um, you know, emergence is 
a domain centric concern. Um, the conditions that facilitate, uh, the, well, while, while the principles of art may be universal across domains and across media, what facilitates emergence in dance is different than what facilitates emergence in photography is different than what facilitates emergence in organization. And for me, it's malpractice to engage in any medium outside a deep uh, mastery of the medium in addition to deep mastery of cross medium um, concerns. So I'd sort of pop that in and I'm going to go back to listening. Thank you all. That's a great point. And it sort of um, circles back to the point which I made somewhere in the beginning where I said, well, the, the issue of leadership as an art form is that it still needs some definition, right? Um, we can work with some analog or let's say analogous approaches to say, well, there seems to be something going on there there's something similar going on in leadership, but still we would have to find, um, as you say, within the domain itself, an adequate approach. I think that's where, where, you're, where you're heading uh, with this, uh, as far as I understand you. And I couldn't agree more. Like, um, and by the way, there is the same thing happens within organizational research because I, you know, I study public management. The interesting thing is that within public management, a lot of models were just taken from the private sector. And they said, well, you know, it worked over there. It'll for sure work here. And um, well, not really, no, nope, that's, it's a different beast. So you have to like, at least adapt, if not reinvent the model according to the domain. And the same applies, I absolutely agree with you with leadership, but you know, I'm still very optimistic that this can be achieved. I'd love to jump in here, Luke, because that's something I'm actually working on. And I just wanted to say that, first of all, we need to make a distinction between saying leadership is an art form. And as the previous speaker said, fine arts and craftsmanship, when they've developed an art form with an aesthetic layered over it and understanding the principles of that art form. That's genuine expertise. And so we can't just whitewash leadership as an art form with the masters in their craft, as the previous speaker said. And what I've noticed is we have these two ways of thinking. One is deductive. So we bring all the data, multiple data down to a single bottom line or a number. And every organization needs those thinkers. They're experts, the accountants, the numbers guys, the crunchers, the bottom liners. Their gift is to bring a range of data down to one answer. The other thinkers are the convergent thinkers. These are the people we're talking about who understand the art form. They will take a single problem and they will open it up and have multiple possibilities. There's not one right answer, there's multiple answers. So all our brains can do either the deductive or the, the, the divergent or the convergent thinking. And when we talk about these people who have integrated both, these are the exceptional talent in any organization. And when we talk about the art forms within an organization, yes, there are layers. And this is the model I've been working on. Though. You can practice the arts to make money. So that's like the lowest form of this art form. It's going to be the marketing branch. You can, yes, you can take all these beautiful images and render them into a 2D thing that will generate money. Um, then you can take your art form and to another level, which is the storytelling, which even the marketing brands of all organizations now do that. They do the story. They've monetized how to tell the story. But then there's Netflix and movies and books. And you can take that art form to another whole level, which is then therapeutic. That's specifically my PhD, but I, I'll explain that. Um, so that art form now is working at a deeper and deeper level. That art form is changing you, not just the bottom line for your business. So that's the therapeutic level. You've now entered it so much that you've changed. Then there's another whole level where you've taken your art form into activism, which means you've changed the world around you as well, deliberately through your art form. Like I work with refugees, for example, in, in, in camps and people who've suffered 
global traumas after tsunamis and pandemic, blah, blah. So you can take the art form into a therapeutic transformative situation. That's a whole different level. And I personally think the, the most wonderful level of all is when you're using that art form as a meditation and a spiritual practice. So I'm writing a book on this right now about how we, how we take the arts and use them deliberately at deeper and deeper levels until where the final one is really when you're channeling, when you've lost your own boundaries and you're receiving as a transmitter and a signaler something that is beyond you, you're empty and it's just coming through you and that's changing culture as a whole. So. Uh, thanks so much for bringing that in, Luke. Uh, we do believe that they need to understand this better, and that's why I'm engaged in that too. I'm Sally. I'm complete. That's wonderful, Sally. I really, it's it's amazing how you describe that. I couldn't couldn't do that better. And to AM's point, again, the question, of course, is within that art form: what is the material? What is the substance you're working with? And all that, you know, you would have to reinvent. Yeah, you can't say, oh, it's like I'm taking a photograph or, oh, I'm gonna do this dance move now. No, that's something, I agree, it's something, it's an entirely different discipline. And to what, to what Sally said, because I had this experience of this transformational, you said, um, yeah, activism, how to change the world, is because I worked in the public sector, that was what happened to me. I took certain types of information let them act on me and transform me and was able also to change something in the world, I hope for the better, <laughs> you know, who knows? But that is what I actually experienced. So we would, one would have to redefine actually the craft and the material which it works with, which probably is some sort of information. Uh, that would be my first best guess, I guess. But um, that, I just love what Sally said there, thank you. Luke, John Cannon here, just below you in the the group. Um, I have to, uh, this is kind of a follow-up, I think, on, on the latter part of what uh, Dr. Sally was talking about. I absolutely love group work. Uh, it used to scare me because in the old days in psych hospitals, the way you'd learn is they just throw you in and you just do a group with no skill development whatsoever. But the latter part of uh, my practice, I actually learned to form, and my question is really more about form than the art, just uh, in the way of background to know where I'm coming from. I don't know if you're familiar with Arnold Mandel's process work, uh, for example. I don't want to drop names if they don't, you know, have some um, means of communicating about it. But I also worked with uh, uh, a dear friend of mine in Boulder. It used to be group leadership training and that morphed into uh, Matrix Leadership Institute. But uh, so my question is, I once led, did a group with uh, 15 men from uh, all around the country and we built a sweat lodge. And, uh, you know, the task was not the it was all about the process. So we could go between task and then split off uh, and do process and then back to task and also working with the the environment and the living things around that, that developed that, and then the transpersonal with the sweat lodge experience. Uh, so my question is, if you were gonna do, uh, you can take this in any direction, if you were gonna do a, a group um, with the people here in this room, what would the structure look like? What kind of um, kind of granular, processes would you introduce? Is it a, a decentralization of leadership and teaching leadership? Uh, so whatever direction your imagination wants to take you, doesn't necessarily have to be this room, but I'm sort of asking about the, the granular steps of the form that you're talking about. I hope that was clear because it confused, my, it even, my question even is confusing me, so. That's it, Th and thanks for being here. I love the, all the questions and answers. That's all I got. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question because I mean, right now we are sort of at this level of, uh, you know, explicitness. And so, so, uh, I think, um, yeah, even trying to have a rational discussion about something which is not quite so rational. So that's that's interesting. We're going like through this question and answer process and 
I'm going like, yeah, sh is this now the right way how to talk about this? Like, should we like even do that? Isn't it, shouldn't there be another process and how to feel it more than rather to rationalize it? And, but there is always this need to rationalize it. And so I think you're, you're right there. And um, well, I, there's, there's something which I think uh, groups can, I mean, should, should, can, should, however you want to phrase it, um, have a group experience about what is the type of uh, connections they are having, what type of culture, what type of, uh, yeah, collective subconscious are they experiencing? So that's probably what I, I've been doing that with groups. So, so probably that's something like that I would be doing and exploring that um, cultural substrate through um, a group or a collective metaphorical thinking process and saying like, okay, I would try to make that visible and um yeah sometimes i do that so with groups and um the yeah i mean that's that's something something you, you could do and i think there's but there's more um i mean we heard heard about improv theater where it's not just um um seeing these the the the, the group culture but it's rather experiencing it through uh through your body and through your actions and through what you're saying and um I think that's also a very good way how to experience that. So I think there's different approaches and, um, but I use, I usually work a lot with meta group metaphorical thinking. And, um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think you're, you're right that not everything is um, necessarily at the individual level, but you know, can also be, we could also address groups and see how they, what sort of uh, culture and relationships they have with each other. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, uh, maybe it's, it's a good time to step away a little bit for me from the from answer and be just having like an open floor um, um, dialogue. I think that would be probably now a good time how how to approach that if um, if everybody is up for that. So I would not. Yeah. It's interesting. I just want to add to what you just said, Luke, is something that I was recognizing over the last two years in COVID is the piece of taking people to a deep level in the room down to the bottom of the U for those who know Otto Schirmer's work or there's so many different models of what it means to drop into a deeper understanding of listening to the center of the room and, and doing our own inner work as leaders, but the tapping the collective intelligence, the collective deeper journey that is the piece that's just excruciatingly hard on 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 zoom on video um and i'm realizing it's that experience of collective art that always drops that you know Otto always uses arwana uh, from the beginning and drama and music and poetry and um i've always used david white's work um but that piece over the last two years um, being virtual, just I am longing for that moment of what it feels like to use art to drop a room because I've tried it so many ways virtually um, and it hasn't worked nearly as well. I mean, it's worked, um, you know, as well as, as I've been able to make it work virtually, but just missing that um, use of what you just described. I wanted to tie together some some themes that I'm that I'm seeing that that sort of tie into some work that I'm doing with uh, what I'm calling the intimacy crisis. So Luke, you're talking a lot about, and others have talked about this too, this objective versus subjective, and I think that's really important, right? The the you know you can't throw either out, obviously, right? But when you when there's an object, either you're objecting to it or it's objecting to you and you're cutting the connection. And, and maybe that's appropriate, right? Maybe you need to be a third party observer, right? But the subjective is the opposite because something is subject to, we'll say your perspective or your interpretation of it. And in the same way, you're subject to it. And that reintroduces, you know, roughly speaking intimacy, the quality of, quality of intimacy. And I, I, I think that's actually important. And what, I wanna link this back to the, one of the themes, right, which was, well, you know, you want to science it, right? But you can't science it in some sense, or parts of it you can't be science. 
and then you know you need success to prove that you know to do the non-sciency part the, the artistic part the subjective part um, and I think that's right but I think there's might be a better way to understand that in the frame of leadership uh, one of the problems I've seen uh, from my perspective with leader with the idea of leadership is that it's we'll say maybe not one thing but at least a bunch of things in one place and my experience is completely the opposite when I when I actually look at groups and uh, and, and you kind of see this in programming I have this agile stuff which I, I don't necessarily agree with with agile as a, as a method of, of, of we'll say getting groups organized for for a software project um, not that it's useless or anything but it's it's certainly overextended right it's pure emergence you just try to get things to emerge and everyone's roughly equal but in a good group what I see is different people fulfill different leadership type roles and a good manager and 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 I like that you know we pointed out earlier there's a distinction between leadership and management and we've lost that we've lumped management into leadership and that's kind of inappropriate and what you read about um, in some of the you know how to manage geniuses type books right how to manage the, the overperformers is that the style that you have to use for these people is different than the style you would have to use for different types of people right because egos get involved things like that and leadership seems to be different components that can happen in one person but that's rare but they happen in, in different people um, and different aspects of leadership emerge in the different members and so maybe you can't even teach it, right? Because it is too artistic or too subjective or something in some sense. Um, but, but also, I think if you think of leadership as a bunch of qualities, which may or may not overlap, that can be spread out throughout the group, then you know, what are we really talking about? And, and this is sort of hinted at uh, before. Uh, I think what we're really talking about is the structure that allows people to cooperate to get intimate in whatever the project is you know whatever the goal is it has it you know not not to go spiritual but has a spirit right it, it has a it has an ethos it has a it has a goal and then within that the different components of leadership uh can manifest and they can't manifest without that right this goes back to the point about architecture if you build the sort of structure that enables the group that you have, and it won't be the same structure for every group, right? Uh, to to manifest the different leadership qualities that are required again for that group, there isn't one set. You can't can't make this into a list. Um, then that group will do well, right? Because the people within that structure will that structure will enable them to, with minimum, we'll say, with, with minimum uh, uh, impingement on on you know, something that makes them unhappy, allow them to manifest their maximum efficiency at whatever they're best at, roughly speaking, or, or whatever is needed for the business. Maybe they're not the best at it, but, but they're the best in the group at it or something. And so adding that, that idea of leadership is not like one thing or one set of things that's in one place, but it's actually spread throughout some structure. And then I think, again, when you think of structure, this goes back to the idea that, well, you can't just teach uh, you know a generic leadership course and expect it to work for any group uh, and 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 reintroducing the idea of management because some people are good at managing we'll say processes right they may not be good at managing people at all like like I'm not good at managing people but I'm really excellent at managing processes right because I, I can see where the things are connected right and that's a totally different skill though like where do you want your resources deployed oh well this I, I can just tell you, like I can just look at a situation and go, no, 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 you're deploying your resources wrong. It needs to be deployed this way. And that, but that's only one aspect of management, the same as leadership. So the disambiguating leadership and management, I think is important, uh, right? Because we heard the story, right? Like, oh, they didn't want any management. Of course, management emerges. And, and again, in, in the software shop with Agile, these leadership qualities or, or, and even the management itself can emerge. And people just kind of they, they find their space in the structure and then they manifest you know whatever it is they're best at and that helps everybody but I, but I think disambiguating leadership from an object right or or from uh, uh, a bunch of qualities that can be assigned to an object or a person or, or a single space is actually really important in reintroducing or, or dare I say re-enchanting uh, leadership as a method of um, 
uh, or not in as a, as a bunch of, of uh, properties that emerge from a well thought out structure. And not that that structure can't be flexible, but I, I think thinking of it that way, at least for me, has been very helpful. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and jump in right there. Thank you, Mark. I um, want to reset the room. We've got about 30 minutes left here. And uh, we want to make sure we hear from everybody on stage. Uh, we haven't heard from uh, Andrea, Sage, or Maceo yet. Um, and if any of our regular moderators, too, wanted to get a chance to jump in, um, we usually wrap up around 2 o'clock. So if you wanted to, um, or we usually wrap up in about 30 minutes, depending on your time zone. Um, and then, um, Luke, I thought I heard you say that um, switching the format a little bit was something that uh, you were hoping for. So, um, uh, is like hearing from the rest of the folks good for you, or did you have an exercise in mind, or did you just want to listen to the discussion a little bit instead of you know feeling like you had to respond? I want to give you the freedom to do what's best for you there. Yeah, I was just hoping now to. Uh take a back seat and, and let everybody just come up with their own thoughts instead of me like interjecting always mine. I think oh, it was a lot. Yeah, of fun. that's I, great. I, I loved that. <laughs> like I just loved, you know, I loved all the contributions and even having the opportunity to have a short dialogue, but I thought now is the time for some open emergence. So whatever comes up, comes up. And I'd love to just listen, listen into that. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. That's, I, I certainly understand uh, that uh, wanting to um, to do that, especially with all these great contributions. So uh, Andrea said that she might be able to uh, chime in a little bit later. Her connection's not that strong right now. So Sage or Maceo, did you guys want to pop in? Yes, uh, quickly um, here. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, my thoughts, what comes up for me is that uh, leadership can be of an art form. Um, I think that in, in the name of like art, it's just merely an expression, expression of a person that is outside of the standard. It's very unique uh, to that person. And you could put that framework literally like on any concept. It can be painting, it can be in leadership, it can be in music, it can be in at whatever. It's just an expression that is unique to that person outside of that standard. Now, when it comes to um, like uh, of of leadership, um, I think that um, it, it, it's it's and it was, this will be abstract because it comes from a place that uh, I don't think we all can like necessarily put our finger on unless we experience it um, ourselves. But from my very own perspective and experience when it comes to leadership, it's actually tapping on the essence of the being itself. And the only way you can tap into that is actually connecting with yourself. Um, it, is, it is the way one connects people, um, mend those ends together. And you can put whatever principle behind it um and and there are things that uh, can contribute like today there's a standard that has revolved around leadership and there's a standard and outside of that standard um it, it, it can be an art form unique to a person the way they can actually connect people um can, by connecting people one puts a very good positive um connotation around it though like as if um there's no adversity that is involved with connecting people um i think a leader actually taps on this this um essence of their being in a way it it um it's an immersion of 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 this fundamental and existential um thing that connects us all and it's their ability to actually tap onto that and actually express that making people feel um, um, like um, they are part of something and the impact is the result. And that is across the board for the well-being of the collective um, in any group. Um, so I, I, I don't want to get into like the, the little particulars because it gets very complex, but the complexity isn't, isn't like um, something that I would focus on. It is more so the simple um, ability to actually 
tap into oneself, understand oneself's um, being and actually um, emerging, like emerging themselves in that. And from that place, one can understand um, people in general. And um, I I'll just leave that there and uh, thank you. I'll jump in and affirm that. Uh, just in thinking about this room, I kept um, having some funny analogies come to mind, which is like, um, um, if if, uh, if if you think about the kind of stereotypical um, artist uh, story, the one where the kid tells their parents, I'm gonna be an outlaw country music singer, or I'm going to, uh, I've decided to devote my life to mime um and the, the horrified look on the parents would that be appropriate if you announce you're going to go into leadership uh and then thinking about the um the some the uh, the idea of the artist as a rule breaker of being an outlaw being um on the edge of society of just by the very nature of what they're doing um channeling fire so to speak or lightning uh, that sort of thing kept coming to mind and so sage when you're saying that i was thinking about that a lot just the um the uh, the, the that that broad space of distinction between almost management and leadership being opposite forces. So thanks for that for sure. Um, okay, Maceo, and uh, let's see anybody else who wanted to share. Feel free to jump in. What up? What up? Hey, um, happy Sunday. Um, this is a really interesting title. Um, love the the extent to which we're um, extrapolating the metaphor. Um, I think that when I when I look at the the, the phrase art form, um, and when I think about what art is, I, it has it has more to do with context than intention. So you know, a rock is can be just a rock, but then a pick a person picks it up um, because of its beauty. Um, uh, on the shore and they want it in their home, the, the rock as a found object uh, via um, relocation becomes, becomes an artwork. So it's, it's not even changed in any way. It's just recontextualized. I think that's a really interesting thing to think about when I, talk, when I think about leadership um, because it, it has to do with that context piece and then, and then the intention part is, well, leadership as a role, I think it is, can be interrogated a number of ways, but I think one of those things has to do with imbuing, infusing, or uh, facilitating a particular kind of uh, intention for the group of people that are being engaged with. Um, and what that means to me is that the concept of, of leadership um, or the act of leaders leading can be distributed within anyone in the context, should they take on the, the, the role of imbuing, infusing, facilitating, directing that intention. And so um, the, the, that's beautiful. The, the only part I like to pull back on is to think about con things we conventionally think of as art that aren't always. So painting, a painting is an artwork, but painting your house isn't necessarily um, doing making art. Maybe your your intention's different. Maybe the way you're going about it is different. And I think that therein therein lies that sort of um, way I make a distinction between the management leadership stuff. Painting a house is is um, is great, but it's not the same as painting a painting. So something about uh, for the the sake of, like I said, the intention is really interesting to me. And so um, not all leading is is art and maybe not all art is leading, uh, but I'm interested in finding what it is about specifically um, intentional acts of leadership that make it artful. Yeah. Um. This is Izzy, uh, if I can um, comment on um, an interesting point uh, you brought up, Nacio, about facilitation, which I think is an art that is unrecognized as an art. And 
to the, connect to the topic that part of the art of leadership is the understanding of how to facilitate, how to guide rather than force, how to um, in, inspire rather than mandate, and all that within a structure that is flexible, but is goal-oriented, mission-driven, and cooperative in co-creation. So I think that's the connection of art to facilitation. And I'm, I'm learning more about facilitation as an art, and it's really very powerful. I think it's one of the things leaders would be um, really, really helped by, by, by learning more about. If this is Izzy, I'm done. I love, Maceo, your point of the rock um, and it becoming art by recontextualizing it. And was thinking about the idea of, of leaders uh, and leadership and recontextualizing people and, you know, their various selves, as, uh, as Jordan would, would speak to. And I wanted to agree and also push back on the house painting thing because I painted houses for about 10 years and I did it as an art form. And I'm perfectly aware that I was one of very few people who actually approached it that way, but um, also wanted to not take over this conversation earlier, but wanted to just plug my dissertation if anyone wants to dig into some really um, heady scientific literature that covers this conversation. Uh, and Adam put it in the link tree and um, that sort of mixing of intellect and art and transdisciplinarity speaks to anyone it's there for you that's me and i am complete and thank you all for an amazing room thank you luke for uh, getting our juices flowing avi go ahead <laughs> thanks um so I was actually quite, I'm quite inspired by this conversation, but I think that's typically what I say in the majority of the conversations we have in this room. Um, and I think it was Jean Houston who coined the term social artistry. And within that, um, I'm just, could you just turn off the dryer for me, honey? Thank you. Um, so within that sort of broader, uh, idea of what it is to um, orchestrate, to paint, to create a social environment within that you have leadership, facilitation. What, Nick, careful with that chair, it's broken. Um, <laughs> I'm multitasking here. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, so we have these sort of um, different colors, if you will within this broader idea of what social artistry is. And within that, within this conversation, we've, we've, we've sort of gone through facilitation and leadership. Um, and from my perspective, it's, it's, a, it's like an organism where the, the who you are facilitating and how you are facilitating is a, is a biofeedback. And that's the artistry. That's the listening. That's the skill that is cultivated in that interpersonal and organizational way that truly becomes the sort of gorgeous mm, um, palette that we get to work with when we move into these spaces of both leadership and facilitation and just sort of on a, a personal note because I'm I don't know I am what I am I always sort of shied away from this word leadership because in the way that I was sort of taught throughout my bachelor's degree, I'm, I don't really see myself as the sort of like hierarchical leader person, but whether I'm running events or facilitating workshops or whatever it is I'm doing within groups, there is an innate leadership that comes out. And only sort of in the last maybe 10 years or so have I sort of come to embrace that leadership, when it's taken out of these sort of mm, very sort of boundaried ideas that you know were taught, uh, or we were taught, you know, twenty years ago, <laughs> uh, and and into these sort of more organic forms, when we, we start sort of seeing natural leadership, and I don't just mean human natural leadership. I mean, what does leadership look like in nature? 
within different animal groups, within horses, within hyenas, within, and I know maybe that sounds, I know my daughter's very excited by this conversation. <laughs> I know that maybe sounds a bit sort of left field, but I find it very inspiring to take cues from these different forms of leadership across nature because they can help to inform a different color palette with different uh, intentional spaces and, and begin to sort of shift dynamics that aren't working, like say in, in a corporate environment where productivity is low, for example, into um, areas that people really begin to thrive. And there's a number of different models now because I really have observed the artistry which has been cultivated within these different um, group dynamics. So my name's Avi Esther and that's my contribution. <laughs> I'd like to chime in here a little bit, <clears throat> kind of come back to you, Luke, uh, as we're moving toward the end of the session. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this statement uh, or this meme forward. And it, it, this room is always um, just overflowing with creative inspiration and the benefit of uh, so many so, so many years of so many individuals deep dedication to their own angles of exploration and that sure has been the case today and i just uh, i'm thinking i want to encourage you luke if you haven't thought of it uh, i feel like you've got a wonderful book on this very subject uh, percolating in everything you've been saying and uh, and what you've been stimulating from the rest of us and I feel like it may be uh, a real great a really great contribution to getting these frames um, more seriously considered by a lot of other people who would probably do well to consider them to have a, a statement uh, that, among other things, just starts right off the way you started with your own story. You know, as I was listening to you and then uh, when you looked at your profile, and aside from the beauty of how you express things, such as from the deep, everything emerges. I mean, that's one of the better ways I've heard that said. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, but in addition to that, I noticed, and you, of course, talked about it, that uh, you have both an uh, Master of Fine Arts, and a, I believe I'm remembering correctly, an MBA. And when um, when Daniel Pink wrote his book, A Whole New Mind, uh, which he, he later retitled, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future, but it's so much of a meditation on the necessity of the, the artistry, the recognition of the artistry, uh, and how art complements science and so forth and so on. Um, that was one of his comments, even at that time, 2005, whatever it was, he was noticing that so many corporations were leaning toward hiring people who had gotten their degrees in fine arts, mastership in fine arts, uh, rather than, you know, the classic MBA route, because they wanted holistic thinkers. They wanted not really just right brainers, but people who could uh, bring the two together. And um, I feel like, you know, we're, we're still in the early stages of having that disposition have a true voice. So I feel, want to, again, just urge you to consider uh, making something of this that a whole lot of other people could potentially read and even drawing upon, you know, some of the perspectives that have come up in this brilliant conversation. So thank you, Luke, and thank you, everybody. This is Samuel. I'm complete for now.
Yeah, I just have to respond to that. <laughs> I wanted to take a back seat because it was, it's very moving, Samuel, to hear that. And I really appreciate it. I just want to say how much I, uh, yeah, what your uh, encouragement means to me. So um, thank you. Thank you. And um, your words are also in God's ears. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Um, I, 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 anyway, it's not time for a clo any closing word yet. So just, but I had to say thank you. So thank you. I'd love to just jump in briefly and say it's a weird world we encounter when there's a hierarchy of our capacity to use symbols. So every time we communicate, we're using some kind of symbol or metaphor, like there's um, numerical symbols, written language is just symbols, images are symbols, even gestures can become symbols. And for some reason, we have put these into a hierarchy and valued numbers over the other symbolic way we transmit knowledge. And so the work of the artist is to reintroduce that into the spheres that devalue it as something non-trustable because people feel secure around metrics and data. So there's a wonderful saying by the guy who wrote the volumes of the left and right brain, Ian McGilchrist, whose work is stunning on this. He spent his life devoted to what he calls left brain chauvinism. I just love that word. So that's what we're correcting here is left brain chauvinism. I'm Sally and I'm complete. I'll step into the silence here for sort of a little bit of not housekeeping, but just a, a gentle reminder if you're new here or not to follow the people in the room. We tend to have some critical and if you're listening to on replay or not. Um, most a lot of the people that spoke today have their own rooms and clubs and do amazing work. I know I've listened to Maceo a few times and Joan Ball is listening in the audience and Everybody uh, who's been in the speaking circle today is amazing. And Natasha also wanted to say, um, Avi, we really appreciate you and love your laughter whenever you come in and speak. Um, and I just wanted to give a final, my own final thanks for both the folks who have spoken today and, and those who have listened and, and held space because um, we feel you and we appreciate you. And we're of leadership improv on some very curious uh, how how these ways will continue to move out in the world so just wanted to say thanks one more time yeah and maceo's um rooms uh, citizen of culture and joan has a new one a jar a j a r with rebecca taylor and And Wayfinders. I forgot Wayfinders <laughs> for Joan too. Not to forget Jordan's uh, multiple selves. Please. Yeah, Thurs Thursdays at four, we've done seven rooms so far, but I was just thinking about, and, and again, Luke, it was a great room. Thank you so much for being here and for, for bringing us all into this 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 kind of up vibrant space, really working with this. I, I was thinking about the idea of of how uh, self leadership or selves leadership starts with solitude, starts with being by yourself. And I, that was one of the themes of this book on mindfulness that I've been editing for the last year, a, a job that's not done. But the author made a big point about how you can't really lead 
yourselves, and he also understands selves and negotiations, he calls them, but you, you have to be willing to take the time to be by yourself and away from the input of other, other minds and, and uh, to really kind of get into the uh, art of leading yourself better. So that's a whole other topic. It's about time uh, that we start to wrap up. Final thoughts, anyone? Um, I will say that um, one song that kept popping into my head uh, as we were getting ready for this room was Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves. <laughs> I don't know why I was like, <laughs> is that a song about leadership? Um, so yeah, but this has been pretty amazing. Uh, any final thoughts, et cetera, before we go? Thank you again, Luke. I'm so glad that we did this. Uh, this is just the final thought on what was just mentioned about self-knowledge as leadership. One of the things that's come to me from the work with the improv, the applied improv, it, and the reason it works is that I believe that the way we play as human beings is the way we are in real life without the real world consequences. So I found that that looking at the way I play with improv or other pieces really informs me objectively as to who I really am, what's my real driver's and um, I think that would be an interesting topic to bring to the room about the connection of, of play um, to leadership. I'm, I'm done for now. We'll, we'll finish there. What sort of comes to mind is, um, especially now having been part of this conversation, is um, that, it, so I realized that, and I think what, what has happened here today for me was the realization, especially after what Samuel said, is that, um, so my, <laughs> my ambition, of course, if you, you're an ambitious person, you go like, okay, this is like the, the overall solution for elephant's footprint or whatever. And um, now I come to a slightly different impression, which is more, again, what Samuel said to say, this is perhaps not, you know, the, the, the solution to everything, right? But it could be like today, a good way how to get things moving. <laughs> Let's put it this way, because I felt there was like, there were all these streams of thought going through the room and I was going like, this is amazing. And even, and I also appreciate people saying, no, that's not like, I, I see it differently. And there's different things moving on here. And um, so maybe I'm, I'm getting a little bit like inspired by this going like, well, you know, maybe I've been looking at this as, as, as a two, um, I don't even know what that would be called as if this is a closed discipline, let's call it like that. Maybe it's not a closed discipline. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something to get something going. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what I felt today. And that's what's starting to get me excited. And maybe that is where this book is located at, which Samuel is kindly suggesting. I don't know. I still have to find a publisher for, for it though. So um, thanks for having me. Um, so that's that's great. Thank you very much. Just so happens, Jeremy is a publisher among other people. So make the book and uh, they will come as it were, or a movie. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I just want to thank you for um, your ratio of hilarious laughter to the concepts shared because I, every time you speak, um, I know you can't see my face, but I'm, I'm laughing that you're laughing, whether it's funny or not. And so I was like, oh, Luke's got all the laughs. And I just, and I'm, I've been experiencing this really micro element of the converse, overall conversation of just like the, the, the humor of, of how you're expressing. And so that's been something really grateful, really joyous and grateful to have this one. I don't know why.
while we're closing, I'll go ahead and mention that Dr. Sally is going to be here on Wednesday. She'll be doing her Wednesday green room at the same time. And uh, let me double check here. I think it's reframing envy is what she's going to be um, bringing to us. So I'm excited about that. Um, all right. Well, I guess it's that time where we go around and say our goodbyes and thank yous. Um, so everybody on stage, feel free to unmic. And thank you, everyone. Spot on about the laughter, Turquoise. It was just really wonderful to hear you, Luke. This is Jordan. I'm done. Thanks, everybody. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Luke. And thank you, everyone. Good to be uh, back in circle with you. Yes, thanks, everyone. And bravo, Luke. Go for it. Thank you, Luke. And um, Pamela, we're grateful you're back. Bye for now. Thanks, everybody. And uh, it feels like it's, <laughs> it's difficult to say goodbye. I don't know why. <laughs> So, uh, Welcome goodbye. to the Integral Leadership Club. Excellent. That's good to hear. <laughs> Hope to see you on, you on Wednesday. And also, Izzy, good to meet you. And everyone else who's usually here. And hope to hear from you next time, Andrea. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you. I stumbled into this room. Um, you know, there are there are no um, uh, missteps on, on, on the journey. This is great. I love the, uh, the intellectual, the spiritual, and... Uh, joyful connections and uh my curiosity is really high now so looking forward to um, more adventures uh, i'm done thank you everyone thank you so much luke um my cheeks are just raw with smiling so much and laughing with you today you're awesome And I think that's a wrap. <laughs> Bye, that's a wrap, everyone. as they Thank say you. in the movie business. <laughs>